Ezekiel chapter 37. We're going to go ahead and I got a lot of scripture to read to you this morning, but Ezekiel 37, we're going to read verses 1 through 14. This is a vision. I want you to know this is a vision that God allowed the prophet Ezekiel to see. Amen. Listen to me. If you feel sometimes too this morning, I don't even know what this guy's talking about. I'm going to do my best to explain it to you. I can guarantee you one thing. You stick with me for a year, you're going to know a whole lot more about the Bible next year than you did this year. Amen. Amen. All right. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. In other words, it was a vision. And he set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. Talking about bones, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? See, right here, I'm already seeing that God is trying to test Ezekiel's faith. He's bringing him to see a situation that looks very negative and very bad. But what he's doing is he's asking, he's asking Ezekiel, when you look at this situation and you see this place and there seems to be no hope whatsoever, do you think that life can come from this situation that you see right here? It says right here, and I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. See, that is the beauty of God and believing him in impossible situations. Because look, when God shows up in an impossible situation and does something for you that you knew you could not do for yourself, you know it's God and it strengthens your faith and it encourages you to continue to trust him. It gives you a determination in your heart to continue to trust him and to walk with him and to believe him. Amen. Amen. Verse six. He says, I will lay sinews. It's talking about like cartilage or soft muscle tissue and, and upon you. And I will bring up flesh upon you. He's talking to the dead bones. And you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. In other words, he's saying, I did what God told me to do. Come on, somebody. Help me out. I did what God told me to do. And when I did it, things started to change. Life started to replace death. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews or the cartilage and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them above on the top of, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man and say to the wind, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe upon these that are slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it says the Lord. You know, this is just an interesting side note. As I was standing there, Troy came up to the side of me. He said, I really don't know what you're preaching on this morning, but the Lord just keeps speaking to me, empty tomb, 
empty tomb. And what the Lord just said right there in this prophecy is, is that I'm going to cause you to come out of your grave. Hallelujah. See, Jesus, there's an empty tomb. Hallelujah. This morning, I'm here to tell you, Jesus resurrected from the dead. Yes. Jesus overcame death, hell, and the grave. And the same, and there's another scripture that I have it in here. It's already in here. That the same spirit that raised him from the dead will also quicken amen. your mortal body yes. and give you life. There's an empty tomb this morning. Amen. And God wants you to know that he's moving on your behalf. Listen, yes, Lord. in this vision of the valley of dry bones, we see destruction. We see the result of disobedience to God's word. Images of death and famine like this are always sad to see when they're the result of the rebellious choices of God's people. But God remains the same. Yes. He always warns with his word and corrects like a loving father when we're moving in the wrong direction. And then when the results of sin are fulfilled and the heart is truly sorrowful, you know what he does? He begins to heal, he begins to mend, and he begins to restore. You see, before Jerusalem fell, Ezekiel's message focused on the forthcoming destruction because of sin. But after Jerusalem's fall, Ezekiel's message centered on Judah's future restoration. Amen? Amen. I already said it once, but we live in a time frame where in the church, many people began to realize, many people are already beginning to realize that there's a shift taking place. I, I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time trying to describe this. I've said it before in the church, but there's a movement in the church and it's been going on for many, many years and it's called the seeker sensitive movement. And what it means is, is that there's people that are seeking for spiritual help. And what had happened is, is that they'll show up at a church, but the church started to get a little bit savvy. And what they start were in a worldly sense. And they started realizing that the church is so different than the world. If we give them the way the church is really supposed to be, then they're not going to be comfortable with yeah. it. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the church look a little bit more like the world. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to sit here and paint it out for you if you can't tell what the difference is. Then Lord, help us. Amen. The world is not the church and the church is not the world. The two are separated. Amen. And that there's a dividing line. Amen. And God is holy and man is sinful and the world is full of sin. And it's so bad that you can't paint it up and make it look different to try to cover up its flaws. No. God says, come out from amongst them, says the Lord. Be ye separate, says the Lord. Amen. That's what the Lord is calling his church to do. That's the word of the Lord. And we have to, if we're going to do God's work, we have to present it God's way. That's right. Amen. Amen. But in the modern church that we live in, seeker sensitivity. Oh, let us make the certain music service a little less long. Let us take the choir robes off. Let us dim the lights. Let us do it. Out. Listen, I, I don't even have a problem with dim lights. I'm just trying to make a point. Let us make everything so comfortable and so convenient that the people feel comfortable so that they'll come back next week. Well, if I do all of that. Guess what? I'm going to have to keep on doing it every week to keep you here. No, let those that desire to hear the word of the Lord and to find truth in Christ, amen, come to him like a well of living water that he is. And he will bring healing, amen. But if you choose not to and you choose instead to drink from a polluted well, Lord help you. Because a little bit of poison is not good. Uh, I wasn't planning on this, but I heard this story one time. I heard this story one time where this young guy, he had his friend sleep over. And they were watching horror movies, and the daddy just wasn't down with horror movies, and he overheard them come in, and he came into the room. He said, what are y'all watching? Oh, oh, we're just, it's not a bad one, dad. It's just like a little bit. It's not that big of a deal. And his daddy's like, oh, really? No, you know that I don't want you watching that kind of stuff. I don't believe that it's good, and just a little bit is still bad. So the next morning, guess what? Daddy had a big old platter of brownies waiting for them. Boy, they just started eating on them brownies, and them brownies were so good. And he's like, dad, man, I've never eaten brownies this good before. He's like, yeah, I got a little something in there for you. He's like, oh, what did you, hey, put, put, put a little bit of pinch of the dog's poop in there. <laughs> what are you talking about? No, it was just a little pinch. It was just a little bit, and you can't even tell the difference. The point being is, is that, no, a little bit of poison is bad. Yeah. It's not okay to have a little bit of poison. The Word of God, Jesus said this, that you have a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. The word leaven means yeast. Yeast begins to spread through the whole batch of dough, and it literally changes the nature of the dough. That's why it begins to rise. I'm not going to get into the chemical process. The point is, it changes the dough. 
Jesus was warning his disciples, beware of the leaven, the yeast of the Pharisees. He was talking about their teaching. Yeah. They teach false doctrine and it spreads through and it begins to corrupt the whole thing. I have to tell you, this isn't something new. This move that we see in the modern church is not really something new. Solomon said it. He said, there's nothing new under the sun. No, the heart of man has always desired to hear pleasant and encouraging words. The heart of man never wants to receive correction. Come on, somebody help me. Have you ever received correction at your job or from your parents? Did you really like to be corrected? Amen. There's a, there's a right way someone can try to correct us, right? And, and like I know that I have learned, me personally, I have hated correction. One time my boss spoke a word of correction to my life, and I'm telling you right now, I came that close to saying something that would have changed my life forever. I felt the anger of the Lord, uh, not the anger of the Lord, I'm sorry, the anger of my flesh rise up on the inside of me, and I came that close to making a comment that would have changed everything. And you know, later when I was driving down the road, the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, boy, you sure didn't like that word of correction, did you? <laughs> but he is your boss. And you may not like the way he said it. You remember that when you bring correction into people's lives, amen, and you try to humble yourself and do it in a way where you desire to restore them. But I'm going to tell you something, Matt. Even though you try to be soft about it, even though you try to, to be humble about it, they're still not going to like it because people in their nature don't like correction. They don't like to be told right from wrong. They want to be able to go their own way. Well, you, guess what? You showed up in the wrong place this morning because when I stand behind here, I don't, I'm not real soft behind here. In person, I usually am, and I can't help it. This is the way it just comes out. So I'm going to quit Amen. apologizing. Amen. 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 So God wants to tell the truth. He wants, he, he, the people want to choose a preacher with soft words instead of the preacher with words of correction. But look at this, Ezekiel 13. I'm here to tell you that this isn't nothing new. You ready? Ezekiel 13, verses 1 through 3. Here you go. This is how it was in, in Ezekiel's day. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say unto them, that prophesy out of their own hearts. In other words, they're not hearing the word of the Lord. They're coming up with something in their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. So this is a message for the preacher. There happens to be a preacher watching this morning or will watch. This is a word for you just like it's a word for me, preacher. This is what the God would speak to us. Thus says the Lord God, woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen Nothing. See, preacher teaches preacher and preacher teaches preacher and preacher teaches preacher. And no preacher has gone back to the word of the living God to see what God has to say. God says, I have a word from my word and I want to put it on the inside of the heart of my prophet. And I want him to speak forth my word. But there's a whole group of prophets that haven't even heard my word. Instead, they're prophesying out of their own spirit. Well, this is what he has to say to them. And to the people that would follow them, Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 10 through 14. Because even because they have seduced my people. That's a strong word right there. A seduction has taken place. Don't buy the lie. Hmm. Don't buy the lie. Come on, somebody. Just because some good looking dude. I mean, I'm using a physical illustration. Just some good looking dude starts sweet talking you at work. And he's so much sweeter to you than what your husband is. Or some good looking girl. She, she starts batting her eyelashes and she's looking all pretty over there. Don't buy the lie. It's called seduction. And there's a spirit behind it. And it will reach in and it'll grab its claws and you will begin to pull you to it. And you become blind to everything else that's around you. And you'll think, oh. This was a little puzzle that was missing to the piece of my heart. I need to fill this up with the, no, that's a lie from the devil. And listen, there's a spiritual seduction that takes place also from a message that's being preached that is not from the Lord, but instead it's from the spirit of the man. I don't know how else to describe you other than just like the Holy Spirit will minister and speak through the truth of the gospel. A spirit, a demonic spirit will also show up and will flatter the ears tickle, touch the heart, make me feel all warm and cozy, make me swear that this is of the Lord. Make me feel as though this is of God when in reality, no, no, it's not. 
because it's not lining up right. with the word of the Lord. He okay. says, say unto them, he says, because even you have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was really no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. I don't really know what an untempered mortar is because I'm not a construction guy. But I'll tell you one thing. I went to go look at a house the other day. And in the house, they had this one element in the house because I was thinking about buying. <clears throat> it was an old, old house. And there was a fireplace, bricked fireplace in the middle of the kitchen. And they had fixed the kitchen up. And I'm telling you, it was a modern looking kitchen. It looked great. I walked up to that fireplace and I noticed that there was some stuff on the ground and it was stuff from the mortar and I kind of put my finger on it and all of a sudden it just started falling out like the cement and all it was I don't know if there was I don't know if there's even bugs that eat cement but that's what it almost looked like like there would have been termites up in the mortar and it was just falling out and it just kept crumbling I don't really know if this is exactly what Ezekiel's talking about but it kind of sounds like it is untempered mortar it's been daubed they're trying to lay brick upon brick but this cement that they're trying to use to hold it together ain't sticking and doing its job. That's the same thing with a false gospel. That's the same thing with false doctrine. It's not going to cause the brick of the Lord to stick together. It's not going to hold up whenever you really need it in your trying time. Right. Right. He says they're building a wall. He says there's peace, but there's really no peace. Verse 11. Right. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar that it shall fall there. There shall be an overflowing shower. He's talking about sending a storm. O ye, O great hailstone shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it or rip it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing wherewith you have daubed it? Where is your false doctrine that you grabbed a hold to? Where is that gospel that you gravitated to that tickled your ears and made you feel all fuzzy? Where is it now, that gospel that you, that which was no gospel that you built your life and your foundation on when you find yourself in the midst of a mess. Where is it now? No, it's falling apart because the Lord said, I'm going to send a storm. He said, therefore, says the Lord, I will, I will even rend it or tear it with a stormy wind in my fury. And there shall be an overflowing shadow in my anger. And once again, great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered. Hmm. See, God's going to discover it one day. One day, everything that's false is going to be exposed. Yeah. One day, everything that's not really of the Lord is going to be exposed. Yeah. We talked about that Wednesday. If you would have been here about the work of the Lord and about the work of man's hands. And God one day is going to reveal it. So don't judge something above the, uh, uh, above the appointed time. God's going to judge it. The work is going to be judged. And if a man's heart was right when he did the work of the Lord, guess what? He's going to receive praise from God. That's right. But if his heart wasn't right before the Lord, he's going to answer to God for what he, for what he did and what he presented. Amen. Amen. I can tell you as a preacher that has pleaded with God that he would let me hear his word and preach it the way he wants it preached. I have felt opposition through all the years I've preached. And I felt like, and this is not anything new for me either, from day one. I felt opposition through all the years that I've preached. And I felt like because of the way I preached, my ministry style wasn't very likable or popular. I'm not asking you to. I'm just telling you this is something that I feel like I'm going through right now. And I'm just sharing with you how I feel. I hope you're OK with that. All right. I didn't feel like that my, my ministry style was very popular, that I was very likable. Yet God in his mercy would comfort me with a word from someone else or remind me of a scripture. And it would give me strength to go on. Amen. 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 As I was pondering this message, I was thinking, Lord, here we are again, a valley of dry bones, an image of death resulting from disobedience to your word. Really, God, can't you give me an encouraging message this morning? <laughs> And God would say, isn't it encouraging when dead bones live again, Matt? Amen. Just, just do what I've called you to do and then let me start. And then he led me to start reading in the beginning of Ezekiel. And this is what I found when I got to chapter two. We're going to read some more. You ready? He reminded me that what he's called me to do isn't glamorous and it isn't popular, but it's his will for my life yeah. and the ministry that he's asked 
and called me to. This I have to come to grips with what God's called me to do. I can't try to, to change my flavor to please everybody. Amen. I just got to be real with God and real with you. Amen. This is his will for my life. And if people are going to respond by his word, by faith, I'm telling you right now, he will heal them. How he assures me in his word that he will heal those who heed his word and ask him to minister to them. Amen. You ready? Here we go. Ezekiel chapter two. This is a word for the preacher. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's short. You ready? Ezekiel chapter two, verse one. God calls Ezekiel. And this is what God was telling me this morning. See, this wasn't even in my message. But the Lord, the Lord instructed me to go back and begin to read the beginning of Ezekiel. Because I already had my message written. It came out of Ezekiel 27. He said, go back and read the beginning. When I got to chapter 2, I was like, man, that was a word for me, Lord. So I figured I'd share it with you. You ready? We're about to get into the message. You ready? Here we go. And he said unto me, son of man, stand upon your feet and I will speak unto you. And the spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me. And he set me upon my feet that I heard him that spoke unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. Now, I'm not trying to say that everybody in this room is rebellious. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not even trying to say if you feel like you're rebellious that I'm speaking to you. What I'm trying to say is that the church as a whole has found its way going in a wrong direction. And that there are false prophets that are prophesying and saying that everything is okay. Come in here and encouraging word. And the reality of it is, is that no, God is bringing correction to his church. Because I believe we are in the last days. Amen. And so he says unto me, son of man, I send you to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this day. Verse 4. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send you unto them, and you shall say unto them, Thus says the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear... Oh, I love this. This, this comforted my heart this morning. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. In other words, I'm not going to listen to the word of the Lord. You can preach it all you want to, preacher, but I'll set my feet and I'm going to resist what you're saying, whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall they know that there has been a prophet among them. God says, just speak my word and let it go forth. And thou, son of man, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee. You see, sometimes whenever people, remember whenever you were a kid, and you say, sticks and stones may Break my bones, but words may never hurt me. Isn't that, wouldn't that be nice if that was true? <laughs> uh, yeah. Come on, man. Let's just be real. I told y'all last week or Wednesday night or something about when I was playing baseball. Remember that? Oh, I'm sorry, Mommy. You were here this morning. You got to hear because you're going to remember that day. It was a bad day. for. It was a bad day. You know, they used to call me when I was a kid, Fat Matt the River Rat. What a bad day for Fat Matt the River Rat, I gotta tell you. I was playing catcher. I know I've shared this with y'all, story with y'all. I'm sorry if I bore you. But I was down there, I was like, hey, bada bada he, bada bada bada. And all of a sudden, my daddy shows up drunk. And dude, let me tell you, when the words he started calling me, get your fat blankety blank and front that ball. And dude, that was the best of the words. Why am I using that as an example? I'm just trying to make a point. That words do hurt. And I ain't heard no words like that in a long time. But just the least little words. Because we, we're fragile. Lord help us. I mean, I want to think I'm a tough, strong man. And you know, by the grace of God I am. But we're fragile. We, like, you're hurting me. It's like a thorn in a briar. You're poking me. Quit being so mean. You know what I'm saying? That's what we try to carry that stuff around. It's like, Lord help us. He said, even though you be in the midst of scorpions. That's what he said. Thorns, briars, scorpions. Though their words, though briars and thorns be with you, though you dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of the words or be dismayed at their looks. I'm going to learn not to look. Amen? <laughs> you can look at me like you're crazy because sometimes you're not even looking at me like that, right? I just happen to catch it the wrong time. <laughs> something hits you or something. And you're like, I see your face. And I'm like, man, what, what did I do wrong? I'm not going to quit looking like that. 
though they be a rebellious house. He said, you shall speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto you. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book. The word of the Lord. And he said, what it was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou find, eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. You know what he's saying? Eat my word, preacher. Eat, devour my word. Don't take what another preacher is trying to tell you you're supposed to preach. Take my word and devour it. Eat it for your food, amen, and then give it to my people. Amen. He said unto me, son of man, cause your belly to eat and fill your bowels with this roll or this word that I give you. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth hallelujah. as honey for sweetness. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Sometimes the word of the Lord brings correction into our life, but I'm here to tell you that if we'll grab a hold of it and if we'll eat it, it'll be like sweetness on the inside of us. So remember the story. If you came in late, I'm going to tell you the story. Ezekiel had a vision. God's hand was upon him and he brought him to a valley of dry bones. He brought him to a dry, valley of dry bones. It was all dried up and God asked Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And God, and Ezekiel says, only you know, Lord. God brought Ezekiel to a place that looked like death because of the rebellion of the people. Because listen to me, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But when we rebel against God, it results in death. And that's point number one. Why would he want me to see this? Why, God? Why would you want me to see this mess? Why would you want me to show up in this valley of these dry bones? Why do you let my life look like this? Surely the question should be asked. Why would God want Ezekiel to go to this valley of bones? One reason that God leads us to a place like this is so that we can see the results of the choices that have been made in our life. Come on, somebody, help me out here. So sometimes the choices that we make in our life result in death. And God wants us to be able to see the result or the product of our own fleshly choices so that we will come to the realization that that's not really what we want anymore. And instead, we want want God moving and operating in our life. Amen. That's what he said in verse 1. He set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very drawn. It's important to note that God brought him here for him to see. Amen. It says in verse 1 he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. See sometimes God brings us to places to see things Amen. and we're like man this ain't of the Lord. Oh this mess in my life. Well, well, no, it is. See, God sometimes brings you to places that you, because he wants you to see something. Amen. Amen. See, Psalm 23, one and four says this, that the Lord is your shepherd. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it for you. The Lord is your shepherd. That means, you know what a shepherd does? He leads sheep in a direction. He said that he makes me lie down in green pastures. You know, God wants to bring you to a place where you can get some good food. Amen. Some good spiritual food. Amen. amen. That can nourish your spirit man and strengthen you. He wants you to lay down beside still waters. You ever listen to me. If you ain't never been in a river full of rapids, buddy, and people tipped over their kayak or their canoe and they needed help because they couldn't work that strong of a swimmer and you were about the only one that could swim. That is a mess, brother. Let me tell you, I was yanking people out of that river. It's chaos to be in the midst of a river with rapids. Hallelujah. But God wants to lead you beside still waters. Amen. He wants to bring you to a place where he can restore your soul. Right. Yes. But sometimes he also leads you to the valley of the shadow of death. Right. Yeah. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Amen. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yes. So God might lead you to the valley of bones so that you can see the result of where you've been and where it's going to just end up if you keep on going. But at the same time, another reason he wanted to bring you there is because he wanted you to know that he's with you every step of the way. Hallelujah. No matter how dark it is, no matter how bad it feels, no matter how 
how lonely you might feel at times. Listen to me. You open up the door to sin. You know what you do sometimes? You cut off the presence of the Lord. God's still there. There's an old story that's footprints in the sand. Y'all read it before? It says, Lord, I see that your footprints were with me along the way. I'm paraphrasing. But then look at this. This is the worst time of my life. And you weren't. I don't, there's only one set of footprints. He's like, that's me. That's my footprint, son. That's not you walking by yourself. That's when I carried you. That's when you couldn't even go forward and I carried you. You might be in a place in your life right now that you feel so far away from the presence of God that you can't even feel him because you opened up a door to things. But I'm here to tell you, God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. He loves you. He wants to restore you. Hallelujah. God wants to lead us to those green pastures and that still water. But sometimes he's just got to bring us to that place, right? He has to bring us to the valley of dry bones because he has to get our attention and jar us out of this spiritual slumber and make us see what's really going on. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Ezekiel's vision describes spiritual death. It describes people's walks with God dried up and thrown to the side because of the choices they made to walk in opposition to God's will. This is the result of sin in the life. It results in spiritual death. But God is a God of hope. Hallelujah. And it's so important that we remember that God never wants to leave us in the valley of bones. Sometimes you think you're never going to get out of the valley of bones, but I'm telling you it is not God's will to leave you in the midst of the valley of bones. This is point number one. Why would he want me to see this? He wants you to see it so you can understand the great pain that sin causes. See, Romans 7, 13, you can go there real quick, but this is a little bit of a difficult scripture to really try to break down this morning. So I'm just going to kind of give you like a surface understanding of it. He says, was then that which is good made death unto me? He's talking about the law. He's talking about he was trying to live his life according to rules and regulations, but it didn't work. It caused more trouble in his life. And that's anything that you put your eyes on other than Jesus. Can, can I get an amen? amen? I'm talking about a relationship. I'm talking about you think you, you getting married is going to fix it. No, that ain't going to fix it. That may just create more problem, right? Um, the, the, the problem is being married is a good thing. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, though, if you thought that that was going to fix the problems that you were dealing with. No, you need a spiritual work done by God to fix it. Amen. A pill ain't going to fix it. A psychiatrist ain't going to fix it. Worldly music ain't going to fix it. The club ain't going to fix it. Your best friend ain't going to fix it. No, all of those things are going to leave you high and dry and result in a valley of bones. The law ain't going to fix it. The only, what's going to fix it, preacher? God's will, God's plan, Jesus Christ and him dying on the cross and paying the penalty for my sin, him removing my sin and giving me grace because the veil was split in two and now I have access to the presence of God. Listen to me, the presence of God is the greatest medicine that your soul could ever experience. Amen. Hallelujah. He says that that which was good, talking about the law, but so that sin might appear sin, working death in me that by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. See, that's why God allows you to see the valley of bones sometimes because he wants you to see how bad it really is. And listen to me, if you're not convinced today, hold on, brothers and sisters, because if you still got breath in your lungs next year, I'm hoping that you'll realize it then. Yes. There is something about the flesh of man. There is something about the stubbornness of our own heart and our own head. Amen? Amen. That just drives us forward. We see everything crumbling down around us. We see everything going on around us. Amen? But yet at the same time, I still want it. I still, and I, I can preach it. You know why I can preach it? Because I've been there. I'm not pointing to you. I'm telling you what I've been through as a Christian, still striving for it, but I want this. I still want to do this. Okay, open up the door, Matt. I, see, because see, God loves you so much. He's not going to make you do anything. That's right. It's kind of like a father to a child. I mean, yeah, as a young child, I'll, I'll try to control them and explain things to them and Say you can't go do this because Lord knows if I let them eat cotton candy for breakfast, they go, you know what I'm saying? That ain't gonna work. But at some point in time, man, you gotta you gotta release. You can't control everything. This is a you know, the only answer is Jesus. Amen. Amen. He, he died to set us free. And as we keep going in a certain direction, it allows sin to manifest 
like this valley of bones and we are finally able to see what it really looks like. Amen. Amen. He wants us to be aware of the pain and the heartache and the hopelessness it causes because frankly, he doesn't want us to go back. He wants us to be convinced so that we won't go backwards, but we have a short term memory problem. Right? Look at Isaiah 41.10. I sent this scripture to somebody the other day. It says, fear thou not, Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am God. Do you know what the word dismayed means? It means to look around and to survey your situation and to see the mess. And to be so overwhelmed with the mess that you can't even move forward. You're paralyzed. Listen to me. You got to take one day at a time, sometimes one minute at a time, one little step with the Lord. You can't survey the whole big old situation because it'll drive you crazy. Could you? I mean, I wish that I could really good at sound effects so I could try to make a point. I thought about Ezekiel being not just at the valley, but in the valley and right like like maybe chest deep in them bones and him trying to walk. And I don't know what it would sound like. I don't know. Every time I take a little step. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? And you're not even really moving. And you're not even able to make just even a little bit of progress without. And it's so loud. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so like per perturbing. Is that the right word? This is so frustrating. You know, everybody else in the house is sleeping. Where's the peace? It's only chaos. You get the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. I'm not getting anywhere, Lord. It's such an insurmountable thing. I can't get out of it. One step at a time, buddy. Amen. One minute at a time. Yes. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen. The other day, Robert said he was at work and he told somebody, he said, just focus on Jesus while you're in your trial. And the person said, what does that mean? What do you mean by that when you say, just focus on Jesus? What do I mean? Peter, when he got out the boat, had his eyes on Jesus, but he was in the midst of a storm and the wind was howling and the waves were contrary. And when Peter took his eyes off from Jesus and looked at the mess around him, what happened? He started to sink. He said, and stink. <laughs> he started to sink. You and I just got to keep our eyes on Jesus. I don't know what to tell you. It's a spiritual thing. Yes, read your Bible. Yes, pray. But it's more like a hope. Lord, I look at the mess around me and I, have, I need you, God. It's a mindset is what it is. It's a mindset that says all that stuff I said before. The pill, the psychiatrist, the couch, the relationship, the, the club, the world, the music. All, everything that's contrary to God isn't going to work. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on Jesus because his word says that if I'll keep my eyes on him, he'll get me through this thing. And he's going to strengthen me. And I'm going to learn how to live for him. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The word just made me to look around at the circumstances and be so overwhelmed that you can't move. Listen, this valley of bones looks really bad. There's no way in your own strength that you'll be able to navigate out. But at some point, he's going to say, quit looking at the bones, amen, and start looking at me. Amen. Point number two, God, I'm sorry, can God do it? That's the question. Can God do it? Yeah. He said in the verse, and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? Amen. Look at Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 through 19. It says, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This is another Old Testament scripture. 700 years before Jesus would show up. You know what God's prophesying? He's saying, I'm going to make a new way. What he was talking about was that he was going to send Jesus. And that Jesus was going to die on the cross. And the new way to approach him was going to be through faith in Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. Because it was going to remove our sin. And it was going to bring us back into relationship with God. Amen. Amen. And I'm here to tell you though, this is, what he said, this is what he likened it to. 
like a river in a desert. You know, they say that if you could just get water sometimes to a desert, that there's life hidden underneath there. That's why sometimes you'll be walking. They say that you'll walk in the desert. Sometimes people see a mirage, but sometimes there's literally an oasis out there because there's a water aquifer underneath right there. And in the middle of the desert, they're springing with life. There's plant, there's vegetation, there's flowers. God said that just like a river gushing forth in the middle of a desert, this new thing that I will do in the middle of your life, can God do it? Can God make dry bones live? Can God bring life in the midst of a desert experience? Yes, the answer is he can. The question is, will we trust him to do it? Amen. 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 There's a spiritual truth here. God is asking, can he do it? like in the new covenant and produce life and you inviting Jesus into your heart and your life will be like a gushing spring of water that will produce life where there was only death before. In Jeremiah 29, 11, he said this, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. One translation says to give you an expected end. Another translation says plans to give you a hope and a future. That's a good word, amen? God wants to give you a hope and a future. Amen. He doesn't want to leave you where you are. I'm telling you, so oftentimes we resist it. I don't know about you, but I did, man. I resist. I was such a mess when I first got saved. I thought I had some stuff. I, look, I'm, can I just be honest with you? I showed up at my sister's house. I know I've shared y'all with this before. I showed up at my sister's house. How I thought I was cool, I have no clue. Because, dude, I was a mess. I had on purple warm-ups. I had on some kind of old faded hole, hole, and I thought it was the coolest thing. Purple sweatshirt. I had this long hair, and I was just like, not a dime in my pocket. Showed up in my sister's house like, yep, you know it. I'm the life of the party. Like, really, dude? You're like walking around looking like a mobile valley of bones. And I can remember when I first got saved, and I promise you this has just entered into my head. I can remember Danielle was like, oh, this is the music I listen to. And I was like, dude, that stuff is lame. <laughs> I can remember thinking that. How lame, you know? These people ain't even got, like, man, the people in the world, dude, they can make it sing, baby. <laughs> you know? Didn't know then what I know now. Yeah, it's another spirit of another kind. And my spirit didn't bear witness with the spirit of God because I had been raised by the world. I was a child of the world. You know? Lord help me. That's why we that's why we sometimes we gravitate towards the church that's looking all cool. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that is all cool. Look at me. And I'm like, yeah, dude, these people are hip right here. No, Lord help us. No, the world and the church is not the same. That's right. There's a separation yeah, point. Separation. Amen. I mean, he's gonna create us all the same. We all got different per I mean, I'm sorry, he's gonna he's created us all differently. We all have different personalities, but we're all one in Christ. We've all become the body of Christ. That's right. And we need to learn to love one another for who we are. Amen. Yeah. Anyway, he wants to give you a future now. He wants to give you hope. Amen? Amen. It's really important that we find ourselves in a place that seems. It's really important that when we find ourselves in a place that seems hopeless, like a valley of bones, that we be reminded that this isn't God's intent for our lives. Amen. Amen. God came to give us life. That's what it says in John 10, 10 and 11. The thief came to steal, kill and destroy. But God has come to give you life. And more abundantly. All right. You ready for point number three? And I'm closing with point number three. I know I've kept you here a long time, but we're about to wrap it up. Listen, this is point number three. Flesh can't give life to flesh. And the Holy Spirit is waiting for faith. Amen. Amen. First said in verse nine of Ezekiel 27. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man. And say to the wind, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. You're going to have to give me a short intermission for a second, okay? Sabrina, would you do me a favor and go ask Danielle to come back in here and let her know that I'm going to ask Manny to play a song on the guitar and that she's going to sing a song in a moment so we can worship the Lord together and that they'll just figure that out on the fly. Amen? You good, man? Amen. It's been a while since you picked up the guitar, brother. Praise God, but we love you, man, and we know that you can play that guitar. Here we go. You ready? 
He said unto me, prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, breathe upon these bones so that life will come unto them. God gave Ezekiel a direct order. And the essence of what he told Ezekiel to do was to trust God at his word and to invite the spirit of God to bring life to the dead situation. Amen. Amen. The act of prophesying was to believe and speak God's word in spite of what the situation looked like. You know, many times you're going to face things in life and it looks bad, but God's word says he can get you through. Amen. Amen. And the question is, are we going to believe and trust according to what we see or are we going to believe and trust according to what the word of God says? I want you to know this morning that breath, hallelujah, is the spirit of God. In Genesis chapter two, verse seven. It says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So in this passage that we're reading, God said, breathe upon these bones. So they had skin on them now, but they were still without life of God. So the, the breath of God is the spirit of God. And so many times in the problems in our lives, they seem so big that it appears impossible for anything to ever get better. But the gospel assures us of a different story. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that the spirit of God gave resurrection life to the crucified body of Jesus. And that the same Holy Spirit will give life to our mortal bodies as the spirit of God dwells in us. Can you put Romans chapter 8 verse 10 and 11 in there? Troy said it in the beginning before I even preached. There's an empty tomb. Amen. Look at what it says right here. You might be going through something this morning, but look what it says in Romans 8 and 10. If Christ is in you, are you born again this morning? Listen, sometimes we take for granted that everybody understands. Jesus is the one. I'm about to get into it. Just just everybody just relax. We're not going to be here much longer. Give me five minutes. Sometimes we just need to back up and we need to talk about it. Are you born again this morning? The gospel says you must be born again. I'm about to break it down for you. But when you get born again, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live in you. He comes to live in you and he comes to bring spiritual life to you. And that's just the beginning. As you trust him each and every day, that spiritual life will give you strength. It says if Christ be in you, is Christ in you? I'm not I'm not asking you this morning whether you believe in your head, whether Jesus died on the cross. I'm asking, have you ever invited him into your heart? Have you ever said, yes, God, I need you? He says, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken. That's old King James. And it means to give life to you, to your mortal body, to your human body. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will give life to you by his spirit that's dwelling in you. Do you need life this morning? Amen. Then you need Jesus. I think it's important that we constantly remind ourselves of how the spirit of God works through the gospel. Look at this real quick. Ephesians chapter two, verse one. He says, and you has he quickened, or another way to say it is, he's given life to you, who were dead in trespasses and sin. See, the scripture describes the truth that before someone is born again, they are dead in sin, but God offers life through Jesus. And this is the way that it happens. You ready? Romans chapter six, verses four through five. You ready for this? I don't want you to focus on the word baptism because you're going to think about water baptism and that's not what we're talking about. It says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. What I want you to focus on this morning is that God is offering new life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. When you get born again, the word of God teaches that the old man that was born like Adam the first time in sin dies and a new man is resurrected to newness of life. If you've never invited Jesus into your heart, then you're not born again. You need to come to the realization that, yes, I'm a sinner, but I need you in my life, Lord. I invite you in and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. 
sin and I ask you to teach me your ways. And if you will pray that prayer from the truth of your heart, I'm telling you right now, God will change your life. Amen. Give me new life, Lord. Thank you, you know, listen, I, I spent the, the day with Troy yesterday. And, and I asked him, I, I love people's stories. And he might have told me some of this before, but like whenever I see God, I've been knowing Troy a long time. And I'm not trying to build up a man. I'm just trying to tell you, I've been knowing him a long time. I knew him when it was bad, okay? Mm -hmm. Most of y'all didn't know me when it was bad. But I know that God's done a work in his life. Amen. You're like, yeah, well, you don't know what old Troy, I ain't that I ain't what I'm talking about. You don't know blah, 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 okay? What I'm trying to say is I know that the Lord has done a work in his life. And so I said, Troy, what happened, dude? And I hope he doesn't mind, but I'm going to share a story. I said, what happened, dude? Well, he was in jail when it happened. He had been in jail before. But, but, and I, try, I kept up. Well, hold on, back up. I got Because I wanted to come to the defining moment. What was the defining moment when it happened? He, he honestly said, really, Matt, I don't know exactly when it happened, but I remember sitting in my bunk, and I was on the top bunk. And he said, dude, I was still hustling. I was still like making, moving and shaking, making this happen, do this, do that. And he said, I remember praying a prayer and saying, God, I don't want any more of this wisdom that I have. I, Lord, I don't even want to know how to make a bologna sandwich. I, that might sound silly, but that's, that was his heart. You see, that was the heart. Lord, if I had wisdom to make a bologna sandwich before, I didn't want either. He said, dude, I can make a beastly bologna sandwich today. <laughs> But he said, I don't even want to know how to make a bologna sandwich. But he said, I was up there on that rack, and he said, I was just watching everybody. And he said, you know, he, the way they were acting, oh, man, this one's over here, like, running a hustle. And they, they got the music playing in the background. And it's like, this one's over here doing that. And he said, dude, it's like, this is the world. Everybody's running their hustle. Everybody's doing their thing. And he's like, this is me. Like, I'm part of this. And I don't want to be this anymore. It was like all of a sudden God was allowing him to see it. Yeah. Giving him a vision of what he had been part of and what was destroying his life. Now that may not be you of exactly where you were, but that was so profound to me. Because you see, that's a spiritual moment in the life of one person where God flipped a switch and allowed him to begin to see that where he had been before is not God's will for his life. God basically changed his taste buds. God allowed the born again experience to take place and awaken him spiritually so that he can begin to see spiritual things instead of worldly things. See, sometimes the preacher is trying to be so practical that he does, he's not spiritual enough. It's a work of the spirit. Can God make these bones live? Yes, he can. Hallelujah, but we got to work with him and we got to allow him to work in us. Amen. Amen. See, once you say that and you mean it, that prayer that I'm talking about, something completely new happens. Just like the image of the vision where flesh and cartilage started to grow on those dry bones, spiritually, new life will start to connect itself to you. And this is all the work of the Holy Spirit based off the fact that you believed in the truth of God's word. Jesus is the one that said it. He said we have to be born again. John 3, 3. Just bear with me. I promise you, man. I know. It's been more than five minutes, but I just got three more. John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, I didn't write this. So you're like, man, I don't want to I'm a Christian, but I ain't one of them born again Christians. Oh, hello, Houston. We have a problem. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You ain't getting in without getting born again, brothers and sisters. But what does it mean to be born again? It means by faith you're going to believe that you're a sinner and you need Jesus because he died on the cross for your sin. And you're going to stop right where you are and you're going to say, Lord, come into my heart and forgive me. I need you. And if you'll pray it from your heart, I'm telling you something's going to happen. It's a work of the Spirit. That's what we're talking about right now, the work of the Spirit. Look at John 3, 6. That was born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Could y'all start playing the song for me, please? Yeah. See, this is the work of the Spirit. He said, breathe, prophesy, son of man, and tell the breath to blow upon these bones. The breath of God is the Spirit of God. And wherever you are this morning, I'm here to tell you, God wants to do a work of the Spirit in your life. Amen. And this isn't just getting saved. This is everyday living with God.